Elder Neil A. Maxwell once preached, faith also includes trust in God's timing. For he has said, all things must come to pass in their time. Ironically, some who acknowledge God are tried by his timing globally and personally. We certainly see that in the book of Numbers. The Israelites were thirsty but had no water, so God directed Moses to provide for them. Aaron helped to lead Israel to the promised land, but his priestly vestments were taken from him and he died before Israel entered their destination. God sent fiery serpents, but he also provided the brazen serpent to deliver his chosen people. We'll discuss these events, God's timing, and much more in this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communication specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Heal is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we'll be discussing the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we are once again joined by McKay Bowman, one of our research assistants here at the Maxwell Institute. McKay is a pre-business freshman from Layton, Utah. After McKay graduates, he hopes to attend law school. Thank you, McKay, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are even more excited. Christian, what's going on in this selection of numbers, specifically chapters 11 through 14 and 20 through 24? Here, with the tabernacle constructed and the Lord's presence established, the camp of Israel is once again prepared to move. Their goal was set long before when God promised a land to their ancestor Abraham. That promise has carried us as readers from Jacob's removal to Egypt with his family at the end of Genesis, through the Exodus, and to this point. We know the ending. So the importance of the stories in Numbers is not just the fulfillment of the promise, but the process of the fulfillment. As we read, we are focused on what God is doing to bring about the fulfillment of his covenant promises. Israel is now a great nation, as the census numbers in the opening chapters of this book confirm. But they are a great nation in exile. And it is not just a physical exile. Israel was also a nation living in exile from their God. The story of Numbers comes into focus when we read it as a physical journey to the Promised Land, the spiritual journey into the presence of God. In both cases, the route is circuitous. Just when it seems they have arrived, something happens that knocks them off course. So the other thing that we are asking as we read this book is, what is Israel doing to return from physical and spiritual exile? Numbers 1 through 10 describes Israel's preparations to leave Sinai. They're embarking on a holy war, so the language and preparations are part martial and part cultic. The armies are numbered, offerings are made, the sanctuary prepared, and the priests dedicated. The beautiful language of the priestly blessing, given in Numbers 6, 22-27, and guiding the camp by the cloud over the tabernacle, is also described in this section. These activities take 19 days, and then Israel departs. The remainder of the book describes the journeyings of Israel until they reach the borders of the Promised Land. Chapters 11-20 through 20 recount Israel cycling through the pattern of rebellion, punishment, and intercession. The most significant rebellion was the people's refusal to cross into the Promised Land from the wilderness of Paran in Numbers 13 to 14, which almost led to God destroying Israel entirely. But instead, thanks to Moses' intercession, they were sentenced instead to a further 40 years of wandering until that entire generation had perished. These chapters of movement and rebellion are punctuated by further laws and instructions. Further rebellions in chapter 21 involve the famous story of looking at a bronze serpent as a cure to the bites of poisonous snakes sent among Israel. Chapters 22 to 24 tell the curious story of the foreign sea of Balaam. Part of the difficulty of the Book of Numbers is the interweaving of narrative and ritual, war and worship. This captures well the twin concerns of Israel at the borders of the Promised Land. The book ends with a summary of Israel's journey in the wilderness instructions for dividing the land between the tribes and the cities that are to be set aside for the Levites and for the establishing of cities of refuge. By the end of the book, Miriam and Aaron have died, and Moses' successor has been appointed. The fulfillment of Israel's promises and expectations is in sight, but they are not yet there. Thanks so much for that, Christian. 
Now, McKay, could you tell us more about the waters of Meribah or when water is struck forth from the rock? Of course. At this point in the story, the Israelites were murmuring, they were complaining against Moses and Aaron asking them the often repeated, why did you take us out of Egypt? And they were thirsty, and that was the big concern at the time, of course. Moses and Aaron go, they pray to the Lord, and tells them to take a rod and to go speak to a stone to call out water for the Israelites. I'm going to read just two verses from uh, this story um, that I think are extremely interesting. So this is Numbers 20 verses 10 through 12, it says, Moses asks the congregation, listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. The occurrences of the story are relatively straightforward. But there's enough ambiguity in the details that a lot of us, uh, at least I found myself personally, asking, you know, what exactly was what Moses and Aaron did wrong, right? Because the the water came out of the rock. It seemed like the, the, the problem was solved. And there's a lot of possibilities, and I don't plan to provide maybe a conclusive answer as to what that uh, error was, but some possibilities. One of the possibilities the commentaries I read was simply uh, just the way Moses addressed the people. This is supported by a scripture in Psalms 106 that says that rash words came from Moses' lips, kind of emphasizes that important teaching of speaking with kindness. Another possibility of what this error may have been uh, was the fact that Moses didn't obey God's instructions with exactness. In verse 8, Moses is instructed by God to assemble the congregation and then to command or speak to the rock. However, in the story, we read that when Moses gathers the congregation, instead he speaks to them and then strikes the rock twice. You know, this Gordon J. Wenham kind of has an explanation as to why this might be problematic. He does a really good job. He says the following, he says, though this brought forth water, it was not produced in the divinely intended way. Kind of like Christian mentioned at the beginning, you know, the promise was fulfilled, but the process in which it's fulfilled also matters. Because of this, it was counted as rebelling against God's commands and unbelief. Whereas Christian theologians following Paul's supposed distinction often contrast faith with obedience, this dichotomy is unknown to the Old Testament. Faith is the correct response to God's word, whether it is a word of promise or a word of command. These answers, though at least on a personal level for me, didn't provide a ton of satisfaction because it felt really like I was examining Moses' behavior too much, especially because there's a parallel story of another story of a waters of Meribah in Exodus 17, where God did command Moses to strike a rock. And so I felt like maybe this examination of his behavior wasn't giving me the answer I was looking for. Yeah, sometimes we look to blame a person rather than to look at maybe the bigger picture. So what explanation is compelling to you? The explanation that gave me the most satisfaction that, you know, I felt like resonated most with me came from looking at the Lord's response or what the Lord said to Moses and Aaron uh, after they had drawn the water out of the stone. And just to repeat, you know, the Lord said, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites. And that's kind of what caught my attention, which was to show my holiness. It seemed like God in this scenario was less concerned about the specific behavior or action that was incorrect and more about the outcome, which was that his holiness wasn't shown to the Israelites. So what does this mean, you know, to show God's holiness or to sanctify him? Walter Riggins says it means to show God as being wholly other from us yet ready and willing to commit himself to us, or to praise him for being God, not man, and let him be seen as God. What was probably problematic about the behavior of Moses, whatever that may have been, is that it made him opaque. What do I mean by that? No, it means that Moses and Aaron, being church leaders, had been called to show forth God's holiness, to re- represent his power through their actions, yet remain transparent to his leadership, and that God was the true leader. Now, this is 
extremely difficult. I feel extremely sympathetic to all of the leaders and you know the weight that this aspect of their calling carries. And as I thought about that, it made me think about you know my calling and our calling as Christians, all of us, to let our light shine forth before men. You know that they see our good works, but glorify our God who is in heaven. And so I think that's what this narrative did for me in Numbers wasn't to take away from the high calling of Moses or Aaron, but to elevate all of us and realize the task we have at hand to be instruments in the Lord's hands, help others see who's really at work. Yeah, I think you're right to note the weight of the mantle that prophets bear and to remember that at the end of the day, water flowed abundantly. Exactly. I think that's my favorite part about the story is at the end of the day, the congregation drank. You know, that's amazing. God works forth his miracles no matter what. The mistakes of our leaders won't ever prevent us from receiving any of the blessings we need from our God. Thanks for that, McKay. Now, something that happens in numbers is that Aaron, who we have seen many times before as Moses' spokesman, ultimately dies and is not permitted to enter into the promised land. So what sort of detail do we have to reconstruct how or why that might have happened? So there's not a lot there in Numbers chapter 20. We've got a few verses at the end of this chapter that begins with this episode that McKay told us about so well. And right at the end of this, seemingly connected to something that Aaron did wrong in that episode as well, Aaron is told that he will not enter the promised land. And instead, Moses is to take him and his son Eliezer to the top of Mount Hor, remove his priestly vestments, place them upon his son Eliezer, and there Aaron shall be gathered unto the dead. So Moses does this, and when he returns, the whole community knew that Aaron had breathed his last, tells us in Numbers uh, 20, 29, and all the house of Israel bewailed Aaron for 30 days. This is a really kind of poignant scene, but it seems as though there could be so much more said about it. And this is precisely those moments that early Syriac Christians step in and imagine biblical tales so wonderfully. And so this scene is reimagined in a wonderful Syriac narrative poem on the death of Aaron. And here are some of the details that we would like to hear about. Some of the things missing from the biblical narrative are reimagined by the author. The author, for example, imagines the moment when Aaron, stripped of his priestly robes, stands awaiting death. This is what the text says. And while both brothers were standing on the top of the mountain, Aaron was stripped like Adam among the trees, and Eliezer was clothed in the priesthood of the house of God, and Moses stood and held back his tender feelings, lest he should have wept. And who is it who has a heart of stone and would not weep, when he looked and saw Aaron stripped and drawn near to death? Who could have seen him stripped and stand without the priesthood? and not bring forth streams of tears from his eyes. Throughout the poem, the Lord repeatedly prompts the reluctant Moses to move along with the task that has been given him. And in the next lines, for example, we hear an example of this prompting. The Lord signaled to the son of Amram, saying, Why are you standing about, Moses? Approach and bid farewell to your brother, and let him go to his mansion. For an angel is now standing and watching you for the moment you release him. And unless you bid him farewell, the angel cannot lead him away. This gives us a kind of interesting insight into the way for these Syriac Christians that the moment of death is imagined with an angel waiting to take the soul to its heavenly mansion. And that moment of release, that signal standing, that signal being waiting to, to, to be given. And also thinking about the weight that death has. Even though Moses recognizes that it is Aaron's appointed time to die, it doesn't mean that he's completely sterile to the situation, that he's going about it like some sort of obedient robot. He has feelings for Aaron. He's been through a lot with Aaron, and he's sad to see him go. Yeah, exactly. And we could imagine, I mean, the, this scene in this poem is sort of paralleled a little bit with Abraham and Isaac. Both of them, we have hindered one having to take the other up to a mountain to die. In this case, Aaron does die, but no one wants that job, right? I mean, dealing with sort of post-mortem funeral arrangements 
is a is a sad and 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 solemn endeavor but no one wants to be the person who is bringing about the moment of death and this is this is the pathos and the tension that's brought in and that that brings us as we read it almost to tears so at, at this moment in the story when, when the lord tells moses to carry on and do what he's been asked to do moses converses with god and gives reasons he's used to being able to petition the lord to answer back to speak up and while that conversation is going on the author imagines eliezer approaching aaron and asking for one last father's blessing which aaron gives it says with tears and sighs the blessing is beautiful and moving with prophecy and praise and encouragement it begins with these words may the god for whom i have stood in purity and holiness may he bless your youth my son and grant you tender mercies in the presence of the people may the son who is ready to become a child and to save the ages with his grace grant you a way of life that leads to godliness may the mighty one who by means of his divine will everything came into existence grant you a mind that god is pleased with it carries on in this vein this blessing it with sort of beautiful repetitions of of a prayers of for a, of a father for his son particularly a son who is assuming his office and a father who understands the weight of this particular calling after the blessing moses approaches aaron and bids his brother farewell and kisses him and at this point the poet evocatively imagines the moment in which the soul leaves the body it says as soon as moses had kissed aaron as he had been commanded his soul departed swiftly from his body the lord commanded the soul and she left her companion and the lord commanded the little bird that it took flight out of its nest the lord commanded the dove and it left flying and changed its location but the body remained upon the dust which is its companion and so we have this moment of separation with the soul likened to a bird or to a dove flying up to its heavenly mansion while the body returns to the dust from which it is formed in the numbers account the house of israel bewailed the death of aaron when they returned from the mountain but in this poetic reimagining of the story the burial of aaron is imagined attended not just by moses and eliezer but by the lord and the heavenly hosts this is how the the, the, the poem goes aaron was dead and they stood to perform their duties according to the law and the lord came with them to accompany aaron the priest and while they were standing companies of watchers came suddenly from heaven and started singing songs of the spirit they had opened their mouth to lift in praise for an earthly creature wondrous voices with their spiritual hallelujahs the praises of the angels were mingled with that of the earthly men and the wondrous voices made a joyful noise there for the levite and when the ministrations of heavenly beings came to an end the new priest only just made prayed and completed the service that levite was accompanied with great honor and the lord moses and the young man together with the spiritual beings buried him i find this to be a beautiful and evocative reimagining of the death of aaron even though god stopped aaron from entering the promised land it's obvious from this poem that god still loved him and his burial his burial is a accompanied by earthly and heavenly rejoicings for his lifetime of service as well as the mourning of israel for his loss he was after all as we remember in several occasions the priest who held back death from the camp and saved them many times i love the way that the poet so movingly imagines this moment when we all know that the veil is thin especially how the heavenly hosts burst through that veil with their wondrous voices another well-known story from numbers that of the brazen serpent and what exactly is going on in this situation christian so near the end of israel's journey to the promised land we're in numbers chapter 21 they are once again beginning to complain against the lord and against moses and as a result of this the lord sent fiery serpents among them this is numbers 21 6. faced with physical death the people went to moses confessed their sin and entreat him to pray to the lord to take the serpents away however the serpents were not taken away as requested instead in what may be seen as an expression of deep irony perhaps 
but was in reality a sacred symbol, Moses was instructed to raise up a brass serpent as a means of healing those bitten. This Moses did, and the scripture says, it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived, and the children of Israel set forward. And that's where the story ends in the biblical account. Fortunately, there's more detail in the Book of Mormon about the symbology and meaning of the brazen serpent. What do Book of Mormon prophets have to say about this? It's really interesting to me that this story is taken up, perhaps not surprising, but interesting that it's taken up. And again, as we saw in the, in the Syriac tradition, the story grows in its retelling and grows in ways which are really significant and are perhaps, as we think of the story as Latter-day Saints, are are the most significant parts of the story. So it appears in 1 Nephi 17 and in Alma 33. So Nephi discusses the brazen serpent in a sermon in which he's rebuking his older brothers for opposing him in building the ship that the Lord had commanded. He recounts the story of Israel's exodus, and he explicitly identifies his brothers with these stubborn Israelites who were straightened in the wilderness by the fiery serpents because of their iniquity, Nephi says. Nephi then continues, and after they, the Israelites, were bitten, he, the Lord, prepared a way that they might be healed, and the labor which they had to perform was to look. And so this is there in the Numbers account, if they were bitten, when they beheld the serpent, they were healed. Nephi takes that subtle action of the Israelites and turns it into a work. What they had to do to receive this blessing was to perform some labor, and the labor was simply to look. So from the Numbers account, the way, that, especially the way that it ends, and the children of Israel set forward, from the Numbers account, we can reasonably assume that once the children of Israel were provided with the means to be healed from the bites of the fiery serpents, they would have all looked and been saved, and then they move on. But it's clear from Nephi's account that this is not how he understood it. And because of the simpleness of the way, Nephi says, or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. So surprisingly, although the means of salvation was placed in their midst, in Nephi's reading of this story, there were still many who did not look because it seemed too simple. This recalls items in our own day as well, where sometimes I think that we would much rather cross the plains with a handcart rather than cross the street to perform our ministering or to extend our Heavenly Father's love to his children. There's something about wanting sacrifice to be impressive for everyone to notice that can lead us down to not doing the things that we're asked to do. Joseph, your comments about sacrifice uh, make me think of a scripture. I think it's in 1 Samuel where it says it is better to obey than to sacrifice. And, you know, what you just said, maybe that's what was happening here as well. This desire to have something that was visible more noticeable by others rather than to just simply obey. Nephi isn't the only prophet who speaks about the brazen serpent in the Book of Mormon. What goes on in the Book of Alma? So Alma takes up this story in his sermon to the downtrodden Zoramites in Alma 32 and 33. And he seems to be drawing from um, Nephi's record. But again, our understanding, the nuance of interpretation develops in Alma's retelling of the story. Alma warns the Zoramites that many of the children of Israel, who similarly had salvation laid out before them, nevertheless perished. We're still on the same ground here as, as Nephi. He explains, but there were many who were so hardened that they would not look. So we have this, this is not just the easiness of the way, but the hardness of hearts that's the obstacle here. There was many that were so hardened that they would not look, therefore they perished. Now the reason they would not look is because they did not believe it would heal them. So now we've sort of moved to another uh, level of interpretation. The beginning, we see in, in the numbers account, they were raised up, when they looked, they were healed. In Nephi, they didn't look because of the easiness of the way. Now we have this additional layer that they did not look 
because they didn't believe it would heal them. Not just because it was easy, but they, they just didn't believe that it would work. So hoping that the Zoramites will find the story applicable to their lives, Alma asks them, Oh my brethren, if you could be healed by merely casting about your eyes that you might be healed, would you not behold quickly? Or would you rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful that you would not cast about your eyes and that you would perish? So now we have these things brought together, this hardness of hearts. The hardness of heart is, is connected with the unbelief and this slothfulness of not being willing to look becomes this vital sort of reinterpretation and reapplication of this story to a new setting. So that's interesting that Nephi is being built upon by Alma. How else does Alma connect types of Christ in his ministry to the Zoramites and to others? Alma draws on another symbol here, which is connected. And I think in that connection, we can see an additional layer of interpretation. So we have this brazen serpent, which is ready to heal. And we have to remember that, that one of the main roles of Christ is the Christ who heals, as uh, Terrell and Fiona Givens has so eloquently taught us. But he also points to the Liahona as a type of that which leads and leads us into safety according to faith. So this is later in Alma 36 to 37. Alma's teaching this to his son Helaman. And he tells Helaman and warns him not to be slothful because of the easiness of the way. So Alma's words seem to indicate that he saw the Liahona as a complementary type for the brazen serpent. So, for example, the only instances in the Book of Mormon of the word slothful occur in Alma's sermons about the brazen serpent and the Liahona. The phrase easiness of the way is also used only in connection with the story of the Liahona and the story of the brazen serpent. In fact, that provides another link between Nephi's record and Alma's instruction to his son. So we have this, uh, we return back to this idea of the easiness of the way and slothfulness of hard heartedness. And we, it develops into this really wonderful and sort of complex interpretation and reapplication of this story in a new setting. And so what the Book of Mormon does, and it actually does this far more often than we would imagine, is it draws in other scripture and in drawing it in, reinterprets it, gives it a new edge, a new understanding, a new application. And this is not only insightful in its own right. The Book of Mormon doesn't just teach us something new about Scripture. It teaches us something new about reading Scripture. And that as we read Scripture, we can see new things, understandings, and new applications in our own reading of it. I think that's a great place for us to end today. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast and follow us on social media at at BYU Maxwell on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu slash edu. Thank you and have a great week.